I love going to sleep on this island with the sound of the ocean in your ears. And in the morning you wake up to the bird song and then you go for a lovely walk on the beach. I just love it. She was a closer divided heart Like the light and the dark A divided heart Between two continents and somewhere far a home But where it really lay was deep within her soul But where it really lay was deep within her soul Hello, I'm Nikki Pistorius and welcome to episode 4 of Nikki Pistorius Profiler on Record. And by now you have watched the fourth episode of Catch Me a Killer, the television series which is based on my book Catch Me a Killer. So the harrowing opening scene of this episode gives us an idea of the psychological and the physical torture that this killer put his victims through and he knew no boundaries. It is absolutely horrific. So I asked the chief producer Simon Howley, um, I, I was very concerned about the mental well-being of the actresses and the actors in the series, um, especially in scenes like this. Not just the actresses that had to play the roles of victims, um, also Charlotte, but even those actresses that had to pose for crime scene photographs. They were, they were tied up, they were depicted being raped, they had nuggets over them. And I was really, really concerned and, and I was very grateful when Simon assured me that there was psychological counselling available for the cast and the crew in, in the series. Because post-traumatic stress has a, has a way of developing sometimes unseen and it's dormant for many years. I call it dragon. And in this episode you can really see some of the eggs of that dragon starting to hatch. Now, what the producers here decided as well in, in this whole series is, if you read my book you, you will see there were many detectives involved in one of these investigations. So they decided on an, an amalgamation of the characteristics of many detectives and that would be one lead detective and they gave him a different name. So in this case, the actual side of the investigation was run by Captain Lionel Fulham and the Boxburg side was run by Captain Franz Franke. In the series, Chiara cast Lo Alberts as the primary detective, which was a very, very good fit and he plays Captain Ruan Kratz in the series. And what I loved about this episode is the dynamics between Mickey and the detective. They really, they really got that. That, that. that was really, really great. So we would often work through the night and we would smoke about 60 cigarettes a night. And I've given up smoking, but Charlotte hasn't. So sometimes at night, after an exhausting day, Charlotte would call me and she was weary and she was tired, but we would fool around and laugh and I would tease her because in this series she only got to wear jeans and shirts, while in another series that she starred in was called The, um, the Spanish Princess. And she played the role of Catherine of Aragon, which was the first wife of Henry VIII, and she got to wear these elaborate costumes, beautiful dresses, and in my series she only wore jeans. Also, I think um, Carly Seegers, our, our wardrobe lady, had fun in one of the later episodes when she had to dress up the, the sex workers. That, that was fun. So, Charlotte was weary sometimes when she called me, but I can remember during that investigation how completely exhausted I was by then. I remembered the sometimes we went out with the detectives and we went to, to a canteen. They would push two chairs together. And I would curl up on the two chairs and they would just cover me with one of their leather jackets. And I would sleep amongst all this noise because I heard their voices and I knew I was safe. And I could sleep. On other occasions, if I was on an aeroplane, I would immediately fall asleep. And then once we landed, I was a bit dis disorientated and, and had the drone of the engines in my ears. And as I disembarked, I would check out what was the number plates of the cars so that I could tell myself in which province I was and which case I was working on. 
At this stage as well, I started avoiding crowds and avoiding many people and loud noises. So often at New Year's Eve, I would find myself alone in my apartment and I could watch the fireworks in, in the distance, not being close. And one year I changed to my diary and I realized that whole year I hadn't been in my home well, there's a period of about three months only that I was actually at home in, in my own house. And that wasn't three months consecutively. That's the, the pace of the life I was living at that stage. But with this particular investigation, um, I, I was at home and conducted from my own home. So one of the other um, elements of, of post-traumatic stress, the symptoms, is nightmares. And I remember that I was having a nightmare of so many bodies that were littered all over my backyard. Um, and it was, it was quite upsetting when I woke up the next morning. And later it made sense because I must have had a feeling of this killer because Atrishwood is behind the toy, it's sort of in the backyard. So at that stage, we would get up in the morning and you would go to work and find the body and process it and carry on in the investigation. That, that was normal for us. Um, and then one day we got that harrowing call and about the bodies at the Boxburg prison field. And when we arrived there, I was astounded at, at this crime scene that the fields were about the size of two rugby fields and the bodies were littered all over this field. And we've never seen this carnage before in our lives. And some of the bodies were, that they were decomposed, some of them were just skeletons, and some of them was rotting, maggot-infested flesh, and some of them was tied up terribly, and some of them were really quite fresh. And, and you could see the, the field day that this killer was having in this field, and with the Boxford prison, in, in the distance, and there was there was absolute chaos. And President Nelson Mandela arrived in his helicopter, and the press of the world arrived everywhere and tried to keep people away from the crime scenes. And there there is a scene in in the episode of Charlotte and a dog, um, and I vividly remember that moment with a dog. But it was absolute absolute chaos. So um, talking about the crime scene, here's a little bit of educational focus for you. So what is the protocol on a crime scene? Well, the first thing is nobody smokes on the protocol, on, on, on the crime scene. Not me, not the detective, not even Nelson Mandela, not that he smoked, but nobody will smoke on a crime scene. And the second thing is bodies should not be covered with blankets. Because in, in the 1900s, there was, a, there was Sir, um, Sir Edmund Lockhart, and he had this principle of the fiber traces that it can be transferred. So bodies should be in separate body bags, each one of them. And in one of the cases, there were so many bodies and they were uploaded into the mortuary vans. And later, the pathologists had to figure out why the one body was contaminated with the blood of another body until they realized that they contaminated each other in the mortuary vans. So bodies had their own body bags, um, you know, just to stop the contamination. So um, this scene was, was discovered by a man walking his dog and um, that smelled the bodies of course. And I remember once years um, after that I was invited by the Centre International de Science de Criminal and Penal in France. We will talk about that in a later episode. But in any case, while I was lecturing there to the European profilers, the profiler of the Netherlands came up to me and he asked me why were all the bodies are always so decomposed in South Africa. And I explained to him, it's a vast country, it's a big country, and we have footpaths. And people will stick to the footpaths because of fears of snake. It is only when there is the stench of a body that they smell that they would divert, and by then the body is decomposed. And the Netherlands are small, but they would find the bodies quicker than, than we would find them. So, um, that was the carnage. So, if you should ever be in a position where, where you are on a crime scene, then the golden rule is don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. And I know when we find the body of a loved one that 
we have the urge to go up to them and to hug them or to hold them. And I know this from personal experience because I have found the body of somebody that I love very, very much, um, sadly. So we would want to go up to them and hold them. But the point is, if we hold them or if we cover them with a blanket or if we cover them with clothing for decency sake, etc., you are transferring fiber onto the body. And, or you might be taking, removing fiber from the killer from the body or your hair is on the body. So the best is not to do it. And, and people should remember that sometimes a murder can be disguised as a suicide. So we need the crime scenes to be pristine. So, so I would ask people, if you are in a crime scene, don't touch anything. Don't touch a light switch because you might be smudging fingerprints. Don't wash a glass because there might be saliva or there might be poison or there might be fingerprints on it. Don't wash the floor from blood. Don't wash blood from the walls because blood spatter has a pattern that tells us something. Don't close a tap and retreat from the crime scene as, as quick, quickly as possible. Mind the footsteps that you don't um, walk over the, the, you know, the, the footsteps of the killer. If it's outside, mind the tire tracks. So keep away and keep people away from the crime scene as much as you can. And that would really help the cops a pristine crime scene. Also, there is such a thing as, as in court, there is a chain of evidence. So on a crime scene, um, if there is a piece of evidence lying there, it would first be um, photographed and then it would be written down in somebody's pocketbook and then it would be taken and it would be sealed, go into a container and that would be sealed and that would have a number and the detective would in court testify, I picked it up, I put it in this bag, I sealed it, there's a number on it. I took it to the forensic lab and the person at the forensic lab would say, I received this package with this number, etc. And that is to prevent contamination of evidence. Okay? And, and also tampering of evidence. So don't touch anything. If you do, tell the police and they will take your fingerprints so that they can eliminate you. So that's sort of the, the, the protocol on, on a crime scene. Um, another thing, educational value, is this series has a very big press conference. Now, I must clearly state as well on record that I was not in a position where I could ever call the press release. The, Calling a press relief was, was the privileges of the generals or the police liaison officers. Although General Saker did allow me sometimes to speak at the pre at the press release, but I couldn't call one just on, on my own. That's not quite historically accurate. Um, in the Station Strangler case, because I like to talk about the role of the press, in the Station Strangler case, they really cooperated with us because I asked them to print the profile exactly word for word, and they did. In other cases, we weren't always that lucky. I remember once Captain Pete Bailefeld had, had arranged and planned a whole operation, covert operation, so that we could actually trap a serial killer red-handed. And you do get unscrupulous cops who leak information, and the next morning the whole operation was in the newspaper, so obviously it, it didn't work. And you get unscrupulous journalists that, to them, a scoop is much more important for the sensation and the fact that people could be killed. And, and I think there's an Egyptian god with the name of Anubis, who looks like a jackal, and he's the one that, that weighs your soul against a feather. And I think Anubis would have something to say about the, that kind of unscrupulous behavior, unethical, of, of rather going for the scoop than just thinking of the impact that that could have on the serial killer. And sometimes we were also blamed that we didn't divulge all the information, all the details on these press conferences. We didn't answer all their questions. And the thing is, here's a news flash. Serial killers can read. And David Silepe had a scrapbook of press clippings and so did Norman Simons and many other serial killers do. They read newspapers. And we don't want to divulge all the information. The point is, and also if ever, if you are in a crime scene, Please don't tell the press exactly what you saw or exactly who it was. For instance, during the trial, the lawyer of the accused can say that he confessed um, to certain elements on the crime scene because he read it in the newspaper, or he pointed out certain crime scenes because he read the location in the newspaper, and then the killer will walk. So we'd like to prevent that, and we ask people, if you do want to sell the story to the press, then wait for 
after the trial and the conviction, which could take years. You don't want to make money from it. But please, work with the police, good men and good women work with the police, not against the police. So that, that's a bit of, of, of um, the, the praise. Now, um, one of the questions that was asked on this press release in the series was, was David Selepe then the right man? Um, because he was killed and there were more bodies found. Now, both David Selepe and the actual serial killer had a similar modus operandi of, of offering women jobs I and mean, then they would accompany them and then they would rape them and, and strangle them. And this, universally, is a very common modus operandi of serial killers. And, and it's not that unusual that two serial killers can operate in the same district. That's not unusual either. We have to look more into detail to see what the difference between them was. So, um, this, this modus operandi of, of raping, that fits in with, with the Oedipus phase, the psychosexual developmental phase of Freud. So according to Freud, borrowing from the Greek myth of King Oedipus, who inadvertently killed his father and married his mother, this phase manifests at around four to six years when children discover the gender, the, the genders have different genitalia. So it's a period of show me yours and I'll show you mine that, that little children have, and they're very curious. So Freud's theory states that little boys might be developing castration anxiety when they see and they notice that a little girl does not have the same phallic organ that they have. And then in their minds, the girl was castrated because nobody would actually create her like that. That's what they think. And they fear that they can be castrated by the father because they're in love with the, with the father's wife, with the mother. And this is all on a subconscious level, but that's where it comes from. So little girls, as I said before, is very much in love with their fathers. Some of them actually never outgrow it and they marry husbands like their fathers. Um, so it is, it is plain for, for parents to observe um, this being in love with the opposite sex parents at the stage actually very cute and don't worry, they get over it. So it's, it's a natural phase. However, a fixation might happen when the mother rejects her boy or she's either overly protective towards the boy and then she becomes the castrating parent because she keeps him in a little boy mode and she's robbing him of his manhood. Sometimes it happens then that serial killers or serial rapists, the rapist feels compelled to rape, to express their manhood that they are no longer a little boy. So any woman then rejecting the serial killer as an adult will trigger this initial rejection by the mother and that will unleash a primal hatred for women. So this is how the Oedipus complex can manifest on a crime scene. We also have to establish, and this, this I learned from, from Roy Hazelwood, is sometimes we have a serial rapist who would kill his victims because he doesn't want them to identify them. Or we would have a serial killer who rapes as well, but his main purpose and aim is killing. Is killing. Now, in this specific case, the, the um, actual serial killer case, it was about killing. And what was unusual about the case is not all of the victims were raped. And he later admitted to the detectives that he only killed the pretty ones. He only raped the pretty ones. So here it was all about, all about killing. What really got to me in this in this case and was really frustrating was, was the inconsistencies. And um, we had the crime scene photographs on the wall and, and the detective and I would, would be staring at them for hours trying to, to figure this out. Until I remembered number 14, the note in the Station Strangler case. And then once we rearranged the photographs of the crime scenes in the order that they were committed, not that we had found them, it all started making sense. 
because now we could see how the killer was progressing regarding the bondage. So in the beginning, he would tie up the girl's hands in front and then he would tie them at the back and then he would get more experimental and he would tie a ligature around their neck and they would lie on their stomach and, the, and their feet would be up and he would tie that around their neck to the feet. So the moment their legs relaxed, they would be strangling themselves and they would be sitting there watching that. And that is the level of, of psychological torture that was evidenced in, in this particular serial killer. It, it was terrible. It was, and that differentiated him from David Sebeke. In this case, it was undiluted hate towards women. Um, now, this killer called a journalist, he can call me, called a journalist, and she had ethics. I really appreciate that, and she called us. And she also told me that she felt sorry for him over the phone, and I said, be careful of the abyss of the serial killer. Um, so, she was the first piece in the puzzle, and then um, she was a good woman that made a difference, and another good woman that made a difference was one of the mothers of the victims came forward and told us um, that he had promised her daughter a job, and that helped. And then there was a breakthrough, a man came forward, a good man, and he told us that his brother-in-law had asked him to secure a firearm for him. And he said, I think this is the killer. And um, we were quite happy with that, and he identified him as Mother Sitoy. And um, the detectives that they work and they found an identikit, an ID photograph of Moses at all. So now we had a name and we had a photograph of this person and we have plenty of DNA from the crime scenes. So the investigation team had a dilemma, should they release us in the press, because then they would jeopardize a further um, ID parade. And they decided, well, they had enough evidence and DNA, but they needed now was the killer. So they released this photograph into the press. And it was all over the show. And he called the journalist um, after that. Moses loved the press. Now he was an ego syntonic serial killer, where, where Norman Simons was ego dystonic. He couldn't associate himself with the fact that he was actually a killer. Moses loved it. He loved the attention. So he could completely identify with the fact and he would brag about it, as we see later. So this thing in the public opinion as well that serial killers are these. Um, very intelligent people. That is absolute nonsense. Serial killers are ordinary normal human beings, so their intelligence range would fit into the same normal curve as the normal populations. Most of them would have a normal IQ, some below, some superior. In a few cases where you might have a general serial killer, he is up against the expertise and the intelligence of the whole detective team, the profiler, the crime scene analysts, etc. There's a whole team that he's up against. So they are not like this Hannibal Lecter figures, only in the movies, these super intelligent people. They are not. So um, just for the record as well, um, Robert Reisler did not participate in this investigation. He was in the country, but he was brought in for the press conference, so it was actually a PR stunt, and it worked. He returned to South Africa later that year to also lecture during one of the courses, but he didn't advise the detectives. They were quite competent in catching this killer, quite on their own. So I'd just like to, to bring that in as well, because the South African press also said they needed his help, and, and they didn't. So um, what is historically accurate is that I was lecturing, and I got a call from my general, and he informed me that um, Moses Sitoli was shot and by Francis Mulevetsi, one of our detectives. Now, Francis Mulevetsi later became a commander of Atridgeville um, Police Station. Congratulations to him. But the general assured me that he was in hospital and was wounded and I would get chance to speak to him. Okay, so what is also um, historically accurate is the fact that Moses was lying in bed, um, masturbating while he was giving his confession. What's not historically accurate is neither myself nor Erica was there. This was conducted by another female detective called Cecile, and she was very, very professional about this. And, and I said that he would actually brag, which he did. So putting myself and Erica there, I suppose that's a bit of creative licensing for entertainment value, but it, it wasn't really me. 
What is true is I was never in a position where I could command or order detectives to do something. Issue orders. They were not under my command. I did attend many, many crime scenes. I did attend mortuaries and, and the autopsies of, of the victims. I interviewed surviving victims. I interviewed the families of the victims. Um, I interrogated many serial killers and I secured confessions from them quite often. And um, I was present in some of the arrests. I was present in some of the house searches. I was present um, during the trials. I testified in the, in the trial. Um, and I did research afterwards in prison when I visited them. But I didn't do everything, every time. And, and I feel a little bit that this is the way it's depicted in the series. It is a compelling series. But I also feel that the detectives need credit where credit is due. And, and they were the ones that worked hard. I didn't arrest anybody. The detectives did. And they did the investigation. I was just the profiler. So credit where credit is due. This series is very compelling. It's very compelling. Um, so, where this episode succeeds completely, and again, this is a compliment to the director, Tracy Larkin, is, is the absolute magnitude that the detectives and the profiler faced in, in hunting down this, this serial killer. Um, and Tracy managed to direct that, to depict it without sensationalizing it. And, and I really, really appreciate that. Our minds were running in circles in, in this specific case. Sometimes we all get trapped in our own cycles of thought, our debilitating insecurities, self-doubt and blame. Dizzing round and round like Oribos, the Greek symbol of a snake eating its own tail. What if, what if, what if? We are caught in the grey, dark prisons we create in our own minds, in the abyss. Entering the abyss of the serial killer's mind means getting entangled in the murderous fantasies where lust and torture and killing infuse like toxic vapours, suffocating us, moving in like an ominous dark cloud over the sea, enveloping the ship, and in the raging storm nothing makes sense. Like Detective Ruan in this series asks Mickey, how do we make sense of this? The serial killers create their own hell, and we, the detective and the profiler, we may take their hand to lead them out, and they may slip back into the abyss to stay forever trapped in their fantasies. But us? Somehow we find a step, and then another, and slowly climbing one by one we emerge, wiser, older, and tempered by the storm, and we stand amazed at the new dawn breaking over the ocean. And there is a new horizon that's beckoning us. And this is on the ruins of the old. We will build a new life. So this episode ends. Moses Sitoli was found guilty of 38 murders, 40 rapes and 8 robberies. And he was sentenced to, four th to 2,410 years in prison. I hope he never ever gets out. So I didn't really get the chance to speak to him. I've actually never met him in his life. Um, because at that last press conference, I got a call from Detective Two Goldstone in KwaZulu Natal in Donnybrook, who needed me. And um, I went home, I packed my bag and I got on the plane and I left for KwaZulu Natal. But before we get completely to the end of this episode, it ends on a positive note because in this episode, the character of Mickey meets her boyfriend, the handsome Mark, very handsome Mark, thank you Chiara Mulinoro for that casting, and he's played by the handsome Stephen Ward. So it ends on a positive note. But I will see you next week when we travel down to Pesudu Natal, and that will be for the fifth episode of the series Catch Me a Killer. I will see you afterwards in Keeper Stories on Profiler. I hope you find this inspirational and this is informative, educational, without being sensational. And I will give you an authentic account of my experience in dealing with the criminal mind. So if you like what we're doing, give us your thumbs up, share it, 
and subscribe to the channel and I will see you next week. Thanks. She was a girl with a divided heart Like the light and the dark A divided heart Between two continents and somewhere far a home But where it really lay was deep within her soul But where it really lay was deep within her soul